Give me strength when I'm weary, oh my Lord. Lift me up when I fall, oh my Lord. Light a fire in my bones that an ocean cannot drown. Give me hope, give me strength until my work is done. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all keeping well today. Um, I just want to begin by reading uh, a verse from Isaiah 25. This is first one. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness. You have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. We're going to continue worshipping God. Um, and this is why we worship him, because he is faithful and we can trust him. And he has an amazing plan for our lives. So please do. As always, sing with me wherever you're worshipping this morning.
Good morning. It's wonderful for us to be able to come around God's Word this morning. I must say I'm really looking forward to next week when I will be with you in Union Church. We have a God who answers prayers. Now we've been looking at the book of Acts. We've been looking at Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. We've been looking at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit when the 120 disciples gathered in the upper room were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that gathered a great crowd, and Peter began to preach to the crowd who were gathered there. He started by showing them how prophecy had been fulfilled. And then he went on to preach Jesus, and Jesus alone. He preached that Jesus was both Lord and Messiah. And today we come to the conclusion of his sermon, and I've entitled my sermon, What Shall I Do to Be Saved? I read a story of a Sunday school teacher who had just finished her lesson on the prodigal son. And she asked one of the little boys, Rajan, can you tell me what we must do if we expect to be forgiven from our sin? Well, Rajan looked at her and without hesitation, he said, well, you first got to sin before you can be forgiven. Not the right answer. But I want to tell you the most important question that anyone can ask in this life is, what must I do to be saved? A wrong answer to that question, however sincere you are in your belief or your religion, can lead to eternal tragedy. Because the right answer is vital, we find that Satan has made great effort to bring confusion to people. The result of this confusion is a wide range of wrong answers. And unfortunately, some of those answers are even based on the Bible, but they're a perversion of biblical truth. In our passage, Peter gives the correct answer to this question on how to be saved. He says you need to be convicted of your sin. You need to have a true belief in Jesus as Lord, and you need to repent from your sin, and then you will be saved and receive the Holy Spirit. Peter finishes this wonderful Pentecost message with an appeal to his audience to be saved. And I want to look this morning at this appeal that he makes in verse 36 through to verse 40. First, we read in verse 36, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter's message had been proclaimed under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he speaks of God's resurrection and exaltation of Jesus, which affirms him to be both Lord and Messiah, Israel's Messiah and mankind's Lord. And they have to know that assuredly because he has given them indisputable facts. He's shown them fulfilled predictions and he has shown them the seal of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this was all part of God's plan, the plan of God to show that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. This is the greatest affirmation of Christ's deity. When the crowd began to understand who they had wrongfully crucified, in verse 37 they say this, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter's sermon had been devastating to them. He had charged his audience with rejecting Jesus and crucifying the Messiah. The very one God had made both Lord and Christ, they had crucified. And when they understood this, they were cut to the heart. Those words actually mean they were pierced suddenly or unexpectedly. They weren't pierced to the body. They were cut to the heart. They were overcome with conviction and remorse. The preaching had pierced the very core of their consciences. They had not trifled with a mere Galilean carpenter. They had actually crucified the Lord Messiah and Christ. They understood that they refused the one in whom salvation actually rests. No wonder they cried out, what shall we do? They were experiencing a deep awareness of their own guilt and a fear of God's judgment. 
And this partly was the work of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit has come to convict us. He used Peter, but it is the Holy Spirit that brings conviction. We read that in John 16, verse 8. They had made a frightful mistake. And in this beautiful spirit of genuine repentance, they want to make right. They want to change their future, whatever it involves. Charged with such a great offense, no wonder they've cried out, what shall we do? And Peter was ready with an answer to this. And we hear the first Christian invitation in verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter's answer to this convicting work of the Holy Spirit is the only true answer. Peter calls upon them to repent. Peter calls on them to call on God and ask God to forgive them. This word repent comes from the Greek word metanoa. It comes from two different words. Meta, which means after, and neo, which means perceive. So repent literally means to change one's mind after perceiving or understanding. This perceiving is shown by a change in one's character and conduct. The repentance turns from sin, the repentant sinner turns from sin and self to Jesus Christ. They turn from rebellion and selfishness to Christ, to Him for forgiveness, mercy, grace, guidance, and purpose. And to show that inward act was real, Peter calls them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Public baptism gives the proof of their sincerity for Jesus, an open display of their commitment to him. This identification marks a breaking point that will ensure that they are genuinely committed to serving Jesus. Baptism was to be in the name of Jesus, and that means it's by his authority, acknowledging his claims, following his doctrines, engaging in his service, and relying on his merits alone. Baptism identifies the person with Jesus in his life, death, burial, and resurrection. This verse has often been misunderstood and also misinterpreted. Water baptism does not save us. The New Testament is very clear on that. Repentance is for forgiveness of sins. And after that follows baptism, after we've been forgiven. Baptism is a public sign or declaration of what has already taken place in our hearts, the cleansing of our sins. It is an important step and we, it follows after conversion and it's good for us to be baptized. But we need to understand that we are baptized out of a sense of obedience to Christ and not for salvation. Authentic salvation also brings instant forgiveness. And with that instant forgiveness, we receive the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is God's promise to those who turn to faith in Jesus Christ for salvation from their sins. God's Holy Spirit is received after real repentance as God's gift to us, sealing our salvation. There's, no, there's not necessarily a supernatural phenomena that is promised when we receive the Holy Spirit. It may be necessary for me to distinguish this morning between the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit himself that we receive at salvation. The gifts of the Holy Spirit flow out of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, it's made clear that the experience that the disciples have at Pentecost is different to the experience they had when they received the Holy Spirit, when Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That was their salvation experience. This is a different experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to ask you this morning, have you realized how many decisions you make throughout every single day? We're constantly making decisions. Some of those decisions are trivial, like what am I going to wear today? Well, for teenagers, that's not always a trivial question. But uh, for me, it's a fairly trivial question. Or what am I going to have for lunch? Others are more life-shaping. 
Am I going to take a job across the country that's going to move me and my family from our community? Common sense tells us that some decisions are far more important than other decisions. Now, choosing a spouse is often thought of as one of the most important decisions that we can make. And it certainly is an important decision. And we need to be very careful when we choose our spouse. We need to make sure that they're a follower of Jesus. But deciding to put your trust in Jesus as your savior is the most important decision that you can ever make in your life. Peter told this group of unbelievers about the crucified and risen Lord and encouraged them to turn from their sins and place their faith and trust in Jesus. These words still speak to us today. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't asked him to forgive your sin, you can pray and ask him right now to save you. Once you've done that, then you're determined to follow Christ's leading every day. Life's biggest decision is what you will do with Jesus. The precious and priceless gift of the Holy Spirit was not merely only for those who were in the audience that day. In verse 39, we read this. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The promise of the Holy Spirit, the great gift of the risen Christ, the promise of salvation was not confined to those immediate followers or the first converts, but it was intended to embrace all classes, all generations, every tribe, every nation, every people group. The promise is not only for the people of Jerusalem, but for all the people of this world. Not only just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. Not only for that generation, but for all generations to come. The Holy Spirit is the gift of for all those who call God to be their Lord and Savior. Now, God is the one who draws us to himself, and we need to understand that. God is always the initiator in salvation. He uses us as vessels to declare his salvation to others, but we can't save anyone. We can't make anyone a Christian. Only the Holy Spirit can bring conviction to the heart of a man or woman And only Jesus saves. Verse 40 is one of the most serious and solemn calls for these people to turn and to allow Jesus to save them. It says, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Luke has has really only given us a summary of Peter's message. The quality and character of Peter's preaching are indicated in these words. It tells us that he solemnly testified and he kept on exhorting them. That word testify is the same word as someone giving testimony in a court. That word exhort indicates the earnest, rigorous, encouraging and persuading someone to turn to Jesus Christ. They were commanded to let God save them out of their sinful lifestyle and out of the sinful culture that had captivated their lives and allowed Jesus to become Lord of their lives. Now, you've got to understand that God looks at the world around us very differently than we look at the world. Peter called uh, the world perverse or corrupt, using the Greek word scolios, which means bent or crooked. It's uh, reminiscent of the words of Jesus. You'll remember in Luke 11 and Luke 17, he spoke of an evil generation. In Luke 9, he says they are a faithless and perverse generation. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus says they are an adulterous and sinful generation. Now, all these statements were addressed to a religious Jewish community. And the fact was that they loved the world system that they were living in more than they loved the Lord God themselves. That's why they were a faithless generation. That is why the command is to remove yourselves from this crooked generation and be saved. 
Do not continue on the present course that you're on. So this is the appeal for salvation that Peter makes. And as we close off this morning, I want to look at the result of salvation. Just those two verses, 41 and 42. The result of the preaching was truly amazing. Here another miracle takes place on Pentecost Day. And that is the birth of the church. We read in verse 41, Those who gladly accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. There in public, right in the midst of the Jewish religion and culture, in the midst of the religious group who only two months earlier had demanded the Lord of glory be crucified, right there an amazing result occurred. To Peter's message and invitation. 3,000 souls were added to those 120 that had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ was born, a triumphant church. It's actually quite interesting to note that when the law came down, you'll remember when the law, law was brought down from Mount Sinai, the children of Israel had actually worshipped the golden calf. And the law came down, and we read in Exodus chapter 32, verse 28, it tells us that 3,000 men died when the law came down. When the Spirit comes down at Pentecost, 3,000 souls were saved. We've got to remember, the law kills. We read in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not written with laws, but it is a covenant of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. And we need to remember that as well. As followers of Jesus who've been serving him for a long time, We've got to make sure that we remove all legalism from Christianity because when legalism enters into Christianity, it begins to reek of death. The law kills. Legalism is going to kill. But allow the Spirit to come upon you and there will be a flow of life from the Spirit. The very real possibility for these people who were choosing to serve Jesus, these new converts, were that they would become outcasts in their families, their fr- amongst their friends, and in the society they were living because they had decided to follow Jesus. But in spite of all that, the scripture tells us they gladly received his message. There's an idea of incredible cheerfulness and joy that is expressed in their decision that they're making to follow Jesus. And then verse 42 is a description of Christian discipleship, of those who truly receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. And we're going to look at that in more depth next week. But the point that I want to make about these new converts is that they didn't merely just add Christianity to their lives. They devoted themselves to their Christian experience. Each one who was saved was nurtured in faith as they continued to learn the doctrines of the apostles. They fellowshiped with other believers, and fellowship is so important, brothers and sisters. God intended that we have fellowship with other believers. And they shared around the table of the Lord. They had communion together. And they prayed together. And they shared their burdens with other followers of Jesus. And as you go through the New Testament, this is normative for believers in the New Testament. And it needs to be normative for the church today. We need to follow those principles as followers of Jesus. Now in closing, I want to say to you today, Peter's invitation 2,000 years ago is as good then as it is today. Repent of your sins and believe 
on the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins and you will be saved and you will receive the Holy Spirit. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you can do that right now. You can make him your personal Lord and Savior. Don't delay. Don't put it off. If you'd like to do that, I want to encourage you to pray a prayer with me this morning. Maybe you all want to pray that prayer with me. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I believe Jesus died for my sins on the cross and rose again on the third day. I turn from my sins. By faith I receive the Lord Jesus as my Savior and Lord. You promised to save me, Lord, and I believe you because you are God and you cannot lie. I believe right now, Lord Jesus, that you are my personal Savior and receive forgiveness for all my sins through your precious blood. I thank you, dear Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer this morning and made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to go and tell another follower of Jesus that you've done that and let them pray with you and chat to you. And then finally, as we close off, I want to say to each one of us who are followers of Jesus this morning, you know, as you hear Peter's sermon, he is so deeply burdened and he burdened and he cries out that these men and women will repent. As followers of Jesus, do we have that same passion and urgency for people to find salvation in Jesus for the lost world that we live in? If you don't have that passion and urgency, I want you to pray this morning and ask the Holy Spirit to put the compassion of God in your heart for this lost world that we live in. May he give you a sense of urgency and a passion to see those who don't know Jesus Christ to come to faith in Jesus Christ. As you live this out your life for Jesus in this coming week, may you be a wonderful witness for Jesus Christ and draw others to faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Messiah. The Lord richly bless you. I look forward to fellowshipping with you next week. Give me strength when I'm weary, oh my Lord. Lift me up when I fall, oh my Lord. Light a fire in my bones that an ocean cannot drown. Give me hope, give me strength unto Good morning, everyone. And so what a privilege it is for us to again come around the table of communion. And so we will remember what it is that Christ has done for us uh, as we partake of the emblems, the bread and the juice. And we remember that Jesus' body was broken for us. His blood was poured out for us. And so uh, as we come around the table of communion, I want us to think upon one scripture. And so this is John 19 verse 30. And uh, here Jesus says, so when, well, first, uh, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And so Jesus, he gave up his life with the words, it is finished. And so, so many times uh, we think about how can we be a good person? How can we, how can we please God? How can we earn his favor? And so the truth is just that all of our efforts fall so short uh, of His glory and His goodness and His greatness. And each attempt that we have, the Bible describes it, each attempt at goodness, it says that it, it's like filthy rags before Him. Because all our intentions are just often so self-focused and self, um, selfish uh, as we even attempt to do good in this world. And so when Christ said, it is finished, He meant that his work is complete uh, and so no longer do we need to try and earn his favor he he poured out his blood his body was broken so that we truly might receive healing in full and redemption in full and that no more do we need to earn favor um, before the lord and so it is finished and so today as we stand before the lord uh, let us just thank him for his goodness thank him for his grace thank you for thank him for his mercy um, that he has just poured out in our lives 
And so let us just reflect on His goodness, His greatness, and truly have, have thankful hearts uh, before Him. And so let us, let us just pray before we come before the table of communion. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that it is finished. You have done the work. You have done everything that is needed to restore the relationship between us and yourself. And so, Father, as we come around the table of communion this morning, we want to remember that. We want to remember that no matter what we do, Lord, we can never earn your favor. But it's all been accomplished in the work of Christ at the cross. And so, Lord, we're just so uh, thankful Lord, for your goodness and your, your grace in our lives. And so, Father, we come now around the table of communion and we remember what it is that you have done for us. And so, let us partake of the communion now. First, let us partake of the bread. And as we partake, uh, we remember that Christ's body it was broken for us. Um, and so, he did this so that we no longer have to be broken uh, before the Lord. And so, let us participate uh, of the bread together. And in the same way, we also want to use the cup together and we remember that Jesus' blood was poured out so that we might have life to the full. And so let us participate of the cup together. Father God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, just for the great sacrifice that Christ has made at the cross. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you poured out his life so that we might have life to the full. And so, Lord, may we continually remember this. And may you remind us this great sacrifice. May you remind us, Lord, that we could not save ourselves, but you stepped in and you saved us. And so, Lord, we're just so thankful, Lord this great and amazing sacrifice. Lord, may we now use our lives to truly glorify you. Uh, may you use us to build your kingdom, to shine forth your light in this dark world. And so, Lord, we just come before you now. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Trust that you will have a good week. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you. All that is good to you and may this week be just an amazing experience with the Lord and so the Lord bless you. Amen. To trust in your word, oh my Lord, they will soar, they will glide like an eagle in the sky, they will walk, not be weak.